Well, hello there and welcome to the channel. My name is Derek and today I'm going to be doing my one year review of the Roland Phantom O. That's the Roland Phantom O. And uh, what I've realized as I was kind of scrolling back through my videos is I never really did a video on the Roland Phantom O, the O series. I never really did a video all by itself. Yes, I did a video that I'll link in the description where I compare it to the big Phantom, just the regular Phantom, and talk about all the differences between the two keyboards. But I never really did a video all by itself, and I believe it deserves a video all by itself. And now, especially now, that I've had a chance to use it for over a year now, and use it in a variety of different scenarios, whether it be in the studio, or whether it be out playing live. And so now I can give my opinions on it, and really talk about who I really believe it is for, and who it is not for at the same time, what I like about it and what I don't like about it. So without much further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so here we are now and we're sitting in front of the Roland Phantom O. And uh, in another video, I went over the back panel of the entire keyboard. So I won't be doing that in this video. Uh, the link for that video will be in the description if you are interested in looking at the back panel. But we're gonna start with the uh, front panel and the uh, build quality. Um, so as far as the build quality is concerned, I will say that the build quality of the Roland Phantom O is very, is actually very good. Uh, it feels like everything is uh, put together really nicely, a uh, good fit and finish. Again, I've had it for a year. I've been using it on the road in gigs, live performances and stuff like that. And it's held up, no buttons or anything have uh, popped off or anything like anything like that all the knobs and stuff are still there uh, it really looks you know pretty much uh, brand new doesn't have any scratches or anything like that on it now some of that is probably just the way that i take care of my gear but um even beyond that it is an actual good build quality and it's you know nice and lightweight as well um so I don't think you're really going to have any uh, major uh, problems or anything like that as far as the build quality is concerned um and as far as the layout is concerned, how the front panel and stuff is laid out, I really like the layout of the front panel. And I like the way that uh, Roland has done a great job. The engineers, kudos to them, uh, the the user interface and the way the panel, uh, the front panel and stuff is laid out, makes it uh, makes a very complex instrument um, quite easy to use, especially if you're comparing it to something like a Yamaha Modi X or like a Korg Nautilus. Uh, I find this to be uh, this operating system and everything to be much easier to use than um, those other keyboards. And I'll just kind of explain I'll explain why. One thing is that um, uh, Roland gives you the ability to do a multiplicity of things in a multiplicity of ways. So they don't really pigeonhole you into working in one specific way, but you can kind of develop your own workflow with the keyboard because it offers you a lot of different options. For example, uh, Roland gives you a uh, joystick, uh, which gives you pitch bin and modulation, but it also gives you um, two wheels as well. So you, you don't have to choose between wheels or a joystick, you get a joystick and wheels, right? If you were to go with like a Yamaha uh, Modi X, then you don't get a joystick, you just get wheels. If you went with a uh, Korg Nautilus, you don't get wheels, you just get a joystick, right? But with the new Roland Phantoms, Roland Phantom, the Phantom O, and even the uh, Roland RD2000, uh, it gives you a joystick and wheels. I think that's a great addition. I also like the fact that here you have all of these different um, sliders. So you get uh, eight different sliders and eight different knobs for real time control. That's more knobs and sliders than the Yamaha Modi X or Modi X Plus. That's more uh, knobs and sliders than the um, than the Korg Nautilus as well. So that real time control, I like that. Um, that you have a lot of hands-on control. And I'll talk about some real-time control stuff here uh, a little bit more in a minute. So uh, I also like the uh, screen. So only, the screen is only a five inch screen. So the, the Modi X has, and the Modi X Plus have seven inch screens. Uh, the Yamaha, uh, excuse me, the Korg Nautilus, that has a, uh, a seven inch screen as well. And this has a five inch screen. So it's kind of smaller than some of the other competitors, uh, but you can kind of organize things in a way so that you can still see everything that you need to see. And it is a 1280 by 720 resolution. So you are getting a high definition screen and it's a uh, very responsive the screen. So it's not one of those, I uh, can't remember touch capacitive, what they're called or resistive touch or whatever, like you get, you know, on some of the older, um, keyboards and stuff like that but this really kind of works like an iphone with you know pinch to zoom functionality and uh you know some in and scrolling and stuff like that so you know it's really responsive i really do um 
I really do like the uh, screen and stuff as well. And then you get some synth controls over here and uh, you can control your cutoff and uh, your filter types and stuff like that. So you get some some parameters as well. And then just kind of off the camera here, you might not be able to see it, but you also do get the 16 pads. Now they are not um, they're not velocity sensitive and they're not pressure sensitive, but um, they are these pads. You can think of them as buttons. So you're not going to be like um, doing finger drumming and stuff like that on them um, but think of them as buttons and what they do is they can launch different tracks and stuff like that you can select groups of different layers and stuff together what are in what are called key switch groups and you can you know you can just um, like if you want to select you know layers one and two and then you want to select layers four or five and six and then you want to select layers one three and seven you can kind of group them together add those to the pads and then when you hit the pads it'll select the ones that you want so again a lot of good live performance um, control um, uh, for you then they're at your disposal and I do love these uh, these encoders here that are underneath um, the screen and they correspond to various parameters and stuff that are going to be on your screen and you can turn them they you know they can turn forever in this encoders and also you can push the buttons down as well so these are actual buttons as well so they don't just turn but they're actually push buttons as well again at workflow and stuff is uh, very very um, dynamic so let me just go here and uh, I'm just gonna go to an initialized patch of some sort or scene because everything happens in scenes so you can have a combination of different sounds all put together and a sequencer going and rhythm tracks and all kinds of stuff it all happens within a scene um, kind of gone are the days where you have a like a a combination mode and a program mode and a program mode might be all of your single sounds and then when you want to layer sounds together you go into some sort of combination or performance mode you no longer have those kind of modes you're always in uh you're always in scene mode basically and it's always ready to do anything that you're ready to do but i'm just going to go to uh an initialized um scene here i'm just gonna hit enter we're gonna see and uh, I will go to an initialize scene. Now we're on an initialize scene. I'm gonna hit zone view. I'm gonna hit it a few times here. And so my zone view uh, here, I'm looking at I'm looking at zone number one. So in this particular scene, it's a, just an initialized scene, and so it just comes up with the piano, and I'm just playing zone number one. And it says zone number one right here, and this is an acoustic piano out of the Zencore sound engine. Right, and I can set my key range here. So if I want to set my low notes and my high notes, all I have to do is just click on the one that I want to do, hit shift and hit the note that I want it to be, and it would set up my splits. So splits and stuff like that work very, very well. I have all of my categories here for different um, um, for different instruments. So, you know, acoustic piano, electric piano, organ keys, guitar, bass, strings, etc. That's all laid out right here on these buttons. So these buttons double also as a TR rec buttons. So when you're doing like recording and stuff like that, like the classic um, drum machine style, if you want to use that, you have that here and you can use these 16 buttons, but these 16 buttons also, you know, they're the various categories for your various instruments. And I think that's key because, um, this keyboard has thousands and thousands of sounds and being able to navigate your sounds and find what you need very quickly is very um, is very important, especially when you're working with um, when you're working with hardware. So So I can just hit the acoustic button again, acoustic piano button again, and then it opens up my acoustic, all my acoustic pianos. And I've got uh, four different pages of acoustic pianos to choose from here. And, uh, and I can also go to a different menu, which is my pop pianos. And that's, you know, like a almost a whole page of pop pianos and then a few electric grand pianos, right? And if I come over here and hit the electric piano button, now I'm in my electric piano section. There's six pages for that. I've got, um, uh, five pages of organ. Now I've got uh, currently I'm on zone number one. If I want to access the actual zone, uh, the actual virtual tone wheel organ organs uh, like that sound engine, I have to be on zone two in order to do it. 
So these don't count as that. So these are just the Zen core organs. But if I was on um, zone number two, then I could select something out of the virtual tone wheel organ and so on and so forth. And so I can go through and, you know, it's all categorized. Now, if I want to do a search, I can just uh, I can hit this button here and that's going to bring me to a search because it corresponds as underneath the magnifying glass or I can actually touch the magnifying glass on the touch screen. If I want to, I can come in here and I'm just going to type in soft and then I'm going to hit OK, but I'm going to hit this button to hit OK. And now it shows me every single sound that is in um, the organ section that has the word soft in it. Uh, the acoustic piano section doesn't have anything that has the word soft in it, so nothing comes up. The electric piano doesn't have anything that says soft. Uh, the key section um, looks like it doesn't really have anything that says soft, but what I'm looking for actually is a pad. So I'm going to come up to my pads and the pad actually has a whole, you know, two different, two whole pages. And then, uh, yeah, has two whole pages basically of uh, sounds that have the word soft in it. So I can narrow it down. I can always see if I have an actual, um, something in the search, like, uh, some sort of search parameter because this light will be on here and it's, uh, it's lit up red. So I know, Hey, there's something in the search parameter. So I'm not looking at all my sounds, but just, you know, it's filtered down. I'm just going to select the uh, soft pad number seven. I'll take the search off. We'll hit okay. And now we have a soft pad. So I've got a soft pad now and uh, that is selected and I can actually control the filter cut off here. So I have a uh, control of the cutoff right away, but I can also control the resonance as well with this knob. So I get resonance control as well, and I can also change the filter type. So right now it's uh, that's where it's at, but I can do a JP filter type basically Jupiter. All right, I can hit filter type again, Moog. I can change the filter type again. This is P5, I'm guessing that's probably a profit five. And change filter type again, VCF1. change it again and we're back to Jupiter. So um, I can change those various filter types and stuff like that. Now notice I did, I controlled the cutoff, I controlled the resonance and I changed, I cycled through a bunch of different filter types and I never had to do one, uh, I never had to dive into one menu to do any of that stuff. I could do it with the real time controls. So it's really nice uh, how it's a very complex machine, but they give you enough real time controls and stuff like that. that you can adjust a lot of stuff and drastically change your sound. I can hit shift and hit the filter type again. And now cycling through some other things here. So now this is a high pass filter, right? And then this is a band pass, right? So you got some different, you got some different, um, options there. So Again, didn't uh, didn't dive into any menus and I can control uh, all of that as well. I can also come over here and right now it sets a pan level. And if I hit, uh, if I turn this knob here, it adjusts the panning, you know, right and left. But if I hit control, now it's going to affect these parameters here. So I got my attack, my release, my reverb, my chorus, and I get some EQ settings as well. I can turn EQ on and just uh, low, mid and high gain. So just using these knobs. So if I wanna adjust the attack, I can do it now. Now that has a faster attack. 
come over here i can turn the reverb all the way off and i got my release here shorten the release So uh, I could really change a lot of the parameters just like that. Let me add that reverb back in. I can slow down the attack, increase the release, adjust the cutoff, So again, I just adjusted a plethora of different parameters without going to any menus whatsoever. Now, of course, I can dive into menus. I can just hit this parameter button here, and now I can go into all the deep uh, editing features of this uh, keyboard, and they are very, very deep. Um, so you got your pitch, your pitch envelope, your filter, your filter envelopes, your you know your amp amplitude uh, envelope, amp uh, envelopes. You have your uh, LFO destinations. You have a whole mod matrix. You got a step uh, a couple of step LFOs and stuff as well. And so it really, really gets very, very deep. I get access to the partials or what are the oscillators that's roll and speak for oscillators. I get access to all the oscillators. Every single tone can have four uh, uh, oscillators and whatnot. And so I can go on here and I can adjust the oscillators, add oscillators, take oscillators away. Uh, so it really gets very, very deep. And so if I want to take a really, really deep dive and I do want to get into the whole menu diving thing and go through all the different parameters, I can, but I don't necessarily have to. There's a whole lot that I can do with my sound without ever without ever diving deep into a bunch of menus. So let's say I wanted to, instead of having the cutoff, I don't just want to have the cutoff here. But let's say I wanted to, uh, you know, move this cutoff parameter and I wanted to actually uh, not necessarily move it, but I wanted to be able to control the cutoff using my uh, modulation will over here, will number two. Uh, so yes, I can easily do that. I'll show you a couple of ways that that can be done. So first of all, I can come in here, I can come into menu, I can go into scene edits, right? And then I can come down here to wheels one and two, and then I can uh, scroll down to this uh, where it says modulation, and then I can change that and scroll all the way up, you know, with my uh, wheel here until I find cutoff. And now my cutoff is controlled by the wheel. So So now is being controlled by the wheel. So that's one way that um, that I can do it. But the reality is, is I don't necessarily have to do that. I can come out, exit, right? If I really wanted to assign the cutoff to this wheel, what I could do is I could just hit shift and then I could just wiggle the wheel and it brings me right to the menu that I need to be off and it puts me right on the parameter that I need to be on in order to adjust the parameter that I want to assign to that wheel. I can hit enter here and then I can scroll through, you know, the dare, the various parameters and stuff that are available uh, to me. So all of these are your, you know, your MIDI CC um all of these are your MIDI CCs here, but uh, you have some parameters and stuff. And there's my, you know, there's my cutoff. So I could do it with this touch screen here and just scroll through and then just hit OK. And then, you know, it would be selected. So uh, literally, if I want to assign something to, uh, you know, a particular 
you know, a wheel or if I want to assign something to a button or something like that, like the S1, S2 buttons, I could just hit shift and I can hit the button and then the various parameters come up and I can adjust what I want to adjust um, and assign what I can assign what I want to assign just by doing it that way. So that's really, really good. So the first way I showed you is kind of an old fashioned way where you just, you know, you hit menu, you go into another menu, you go into another menu, you make some sort of a selection. And for me, because I do play a multiplicity of instruments and sometimes, um, because I play a multiplicity of keyboards, sometimes uh, I will have a keyboard, it'll be put away for, you know, four or five, six months, and I haven't really played it that much. And then all of a sudden I will need it for something and I'll pull it back out. And sometimes you're trying to remember all these different menu sequences, you know, so where is this at in this? And where do I find this? And where do I find that? And you get a little rusty. Um, but with this, it's very, very simple. So they really did a good job of, of doing that. I can really easily assign stuff. Um, if I come over here, so right now it's on control, so I'm controlling the attack, the release, the reverb, and the chorus, and so on and so forth, like they talked about before, but I can come here and I can hit assign, right? And if I hit shift, I'm talking about the knobs. Now, if I hit uh, if I hit the shift button and I turn a knob, now I can adjust various parameters with the knobs. I can say, okay, I want to assign whatever parameter I want to assign. I can assign whatever I parameter I want to, to this knob, right? And then you just hit okay, and then it would be assigned. Uh, if I wanted to assign something to this, right, to knob number two, you do the same thing. You would hit uh, shift, you wiggle knob number two, and now you're on knob number two, and you can assign what you wish to assign. Of course, if you're already in the menu to assign things to the knobs, you can just uh, scroll to where you want to go. But I'm saying if you were out here and you wanted to assign a certain parameter to a knob, you just hit assign here, you hit shift, you wiggle the knob that you wish to assign, and then you have it. So not a lot of menu diving. Yes, there's menus, but uh, the rolling... Uh, architecture software architecture user interface uh helps you navigate to where you uh where you want to be so i really like that all right so let's go really quickly here i'm just going to go to my zone select i'm going to select number two Excellent. And uh, number two, when I'm on number two, I can actually hit, um, uh, I can actually hit uh, uh, organ here. And now I'm in my virtual tone wheel organ. So it's not a, uh, right here it would say Zincor if it was like your regular organs, but this is the actual virtual tone wheel uh, organ engine. <laughs> So this is your virtual tonal organ and you got your Leslie or your rotary effect. And I can just hit the parameters buttons and then it opens all, all your different parameters for your virtual tonal organ. So I got my rotary fast and slow. I got my overdrive, turn overdrive off. I can turn percussion off. I can turn the percussion on and I can have it uh, normal or soft. And I've got uh, my chorus and my vibrato. And I've got my draw bars here. Of course, I can control my draw bars with my sliders as well, but you only get eight sliders um, versus nine um, actual draw bars on organ manual. So you would have to navigate the last draw bar on the screen uh, if that's what you wanted to do. But um, but yeah, you know, you got all of your different um, you got all of your different parameters and stuff here and you can set your woofer and your tweeter and all kinds of stuff or whatever. And um all right here in your virtual tone wheel organ engine. The thing I like about the virtual tone wheel organ engine and really kind of all of the like expansion packs in the Roland Phantom O is that they have a continuity to them. So they all kind of work the same way. All the parameters are all kind of in the same place, which means you don't have to uh, basically relearn your instrument in order to learn how to use the virtual tone wheel organ. Everything's just kind of in the same place. Everything kind of operates the same way. And there's a continuity to 
every single thing that is inside of this keyboard makes it a lot easier to learn uh in my opinion um if i'm comparing it to like me learning the core chronos which took me maybe a year to really master it uh maybe 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 year and a half uh to really get my head around it and really be able to master it navigate it and do pretty much anything i i wanted to do with it um it took me a long time. The manual, I believe, was 1,170 pages or something like that. But the thing about that is, is in the core Nautilus or the core Kronos, uh, every single sound engine works completely different. So you can be very, very proficient in the um, HD hd1 sound engine that's in that keyboard and then you when you switch over to the al1 sound engine you've got to learn like a whole new instrument right so you gotta now you gotta go back and study and learn everything it's everything is not you know there is the continuity is not there and so you're looking for different things and how to do different things and a lot of the continuity is not, in my opinion it's not really there and so it's a lot harder to learn now you can make an argument that it's a lot deeper instrument but it is also a lot harder to learn and sometimes just doing a simple task like assigning something to a knob or assigning something to a a, 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 a wheel or something like that can really be a daunting task uh as far as you know using that uh using that keyboard um uh, but this keyboard i really like the way it's laid out i really like the user interface they did a great uh job with that now i will say this this is probably you know this and the phantom uh they're probably my most versatile um versatile keyboards i feel like uh, the frolin phantom o is uh it thrives in the studio and it thrives in a live environment and some keyboards are either or they either thrive in a live environment and you can use them in the studio but they don't thrive there or they um or they thrive in a um studio environment and you can use them live but you know they don't really thrive in that environment you know you that's you got to implement a lot of workarounds and there's a lot of compromises and stuff that need to be made um but this thrives in both environments. And I can see kind of what Roland was doing here, their vision as far as the uh, Roland Phantoms. Um, it's really a hub and it, it works well in the studio and can control all my gear and stuff like that um, really, really easily. You know, if I, uh, let me just come out, exit here. If I want to play some sort of external sound um, that's hooked in, you know, I can just hook it up via MIDI and I can just hit shift and hit this here. Um, let me go out here and hit, uh, oh, sorry, turn that off. All right. So I can just hit shift. And if I turns, if it turns green, um, then uh, that means I'm playing an external sound. You hit shift. And if it's red, you're playing an internal sound. So I can control external sounds and a combination of external and internal by simply go by working like this. So channel number one would be an internal sound. Channel number two would be something external coming from some other sound source, whether it be a computer, whether it be another keyboard or, a, a, you know, a module or anything. Right. And then these three and four, those are internal sounds. And so that'd be something coming from the internal uh, tone generator inside of this unit. And then uh, five and six would be external. So, uh, you, you know, that's a really uh, those are some really good features and stuff like that. Uh, really, the integration there works great. So it's great for controlling other gear, whether you're controlling other gear in the studio or whether you're controlling other gear in a live performance. Also, if I'm controlling other gear. If I'm controlling other gear, it's also great because I can use the great DAW integration, has good, um, a really tight DAW integration with uh, Ableton Live, uh, with MainStage, and uh, Ableton Live, MainStage, and Logic. So if you are a Logic user, if you are a MainStage user and you play live, uh, this has great tight DAW integration and everything will show up and stuff on your screen and stuff like that for you. I've kind of showed that in another video with the Roland Phantom. It works the same way on the Phantom O. Um, so you get great, you get the uh, great DAW integration as well. Then you get a whole lot of real time controls for actual performing live. You get pads, you get knobs, you get sliders, you know, so you get more knobs and sliders and stuff on here than the Nautilus and the Modi X, Modi X plus stuff like that. And you get, you know, some, a lot of real time controls and pads and different things. So you can control a lot of stuff, um, in real time. So it thrives in a, a uh, it thrives in a live environment. Now, this is what, uh, maybe a lot of people may not uh, necessarily realize when I say I can see what Roland is doing when they make it thrive in the studio and make it thrive um, 
and have it thrive in the in a live environment as well. So uh, early on, early on, um, when you're talking about, um, you know, maybe the late 90s, um, uh, late 90s, mid late 90s, uh, maybe even before that. But uh, uh, there was a time that uh, producers, people who produced in the studio and people who played live, they used the same tools, right? They used the same keyboards and everything. People who played live and people who played in the studio, they used the same tools. Uh, but as DAWs and stuff became more and more um, powerful, computers became more and more powerful, sounds and stuff for DAWs uh, became a lot better, VSTs and stuff. There was a time where VSTs, they really sounded really thin and hardware just sounded a lot better. I just don't think that's really the case anymore. I think you can make a strong argument, especially when you talk about sample instruments like uh, guitars and basses and saxophones and you know all kinds of different horns and pianos and electric pianos, that the sounds in in, uh, the sounds in a computer, your VSTs are actually closer to the real thing because they're just larger files, right? There's larger, there's more digital information that can fit in the files and they don't have the same hardware constraints that your hardware keyboard, your cardboard keyboard has. And so it'd be really difficult to tell the difference between uh, the real thing and, you know, something coming, something when you're using a VST, oftentimes it really takes a really trained ear and, uh, you know, anyway, so uh, there was a time when, you know, producers and stuff like that used the same tools as people who played live. And then after a while, people started using controllers and stuff inside of the studio. And if they were going to if someone's going to play live, they continue to use workstations. Um, and so that's what uh, that's what happened, um, you know, kind of around maybe the 2010s or so. You know, there was a big there was a big massive split. And uh, I really started saying, you know, people started saying, do you, do you really need a big workstation and stuff anymore? And all that kind of stuff. So that's what really kind of happened. But now we're living in a time where people are expecting you when you perform, uh, they're expecting it almost to sound like studio quality now. And so now people are taking their studio equipment. They're taking their you're seeing more laptops and stuff on stage than ever. Um and so people aren't just up there with their keyboards anymore, but they're bringing their VSTs and stuff from the studio. They're bringing their computer from the studio to their live performance and performing live. And so this keyboard can thrive at both. You can use this in the studio and you can use it live and it thrives doing both, whether it's in the studio or whether you are playing live because the musical landscape is changing. A lot of people are using backing tracks and stuff now. Some of the biggest bands are using backing tracks and and this keyboard along with my other Roland Phantom they just seem to be to me it, they're the most intuitive keyboards that I own and they are like the most versatile keyboards that I own as well so uh you know it's got your sequencer here um that you can go in and you can you know it's like it's like Ableton Live and it's a pattern sequencer and uh, you can record and you know it's kind of it seems like it's really geared toward live performance where you could you know select your different you know clips and stuff like that and change your different scenes and go to different parts of your song and it's a 16 track sequencer and it's very intuitive and it's actually a very nice uh, it's actually a very nice sequencer but it's not your traditional linear sequencer and it's not all that feature rich okay Okay. It's not really all that feature rich, but I think that Roland is kind of assuming that most people that are really performing, that are really putting together like tracks in a professional way and stuff like that are using some sort of DAW. And so they didn't include a lot of the stuff. So if you need a really strong sequencer, right, and you want a sequencer where you're not limited with 64 bar loops, you want a sequencer where you, you know, when you pick a tempo, you can change the tempo in the middle of the song, or you can change a time signature in the middle of the song. Song, this is not going to be the sequencer for you. So the sequencer, it's just like a pattern sequencer. I would say it's not just completely bare bones. It's a step above bare bones, but it's not really feature. It's not really feature rich. It's not going to be as powerful as a sequencer in a Korg Nautilus, for example. Uh, as far as the sampling is concerned, it just doesn't have that much sampling room for multi samples. So if you're going to be, if you think you're going to be bringing in a whole bunch of multi samples into this keyboard, um, it's just not going to have the room. Um, you know, I can't remember it's 250 megabytes or something like that as far as your as far as your room is concerned or 
but yeah, it's like I can't remember what, exactly what it is, but it's like one eighth the storage of the big Phantom, and uh, and so that's all you get in here for your multi samples and uh, and for your expansion packs. So your multi samples and expansion packs they share space in here, and so the more multi samples you have, the less expansion packs you can have loaded, and vice versa. So if you're going to be loading in a bunch of stuff, if you're somebody who plays gigs and stuff, and you're going to load in a bunch of extra sounds, I would have to say that this is not the keyboard for you for your live performances you want to be looking maybe at a uh a modi x plus because they gives you i believe uh, two gigabytes now uh 1.7 something i can't remember what it, exactly what it is but it gives you a few gigabytes and stuff to load your own sounds but really uh the Korg nautilus is is kind of the runaway um <laughs> i think it's a 60 gigabyte hard drive or something like that uh that you get inside of there to you know bring samples in and stuff like that and you don't have to worry about running out of space uh when it comes to that so if you're going to be loading in a bunch of stuff i can't really recommend this keyboard for that but as far as just a versatile keyboard that can work and act as a hub where you can control all of your external gear and whatnot and you can play internal sounds and external sounds at the same time have a great user interface a uh, great connectivity where you can you know connect other like i use my mpc1 and stuff all the time and i plug it into the um the inputs on here, if it's in, a, and when I have a simple setup like that, I don't need to take a mixer on stage. I just take my keyboard and take the MPC one, and I'm off to the races because I can play the MPC one through uh, through here. Um, as far as the sequencer is concerned, I've used it and uh, played with it and whatnot, but just kind of like getting used to it, learning how to use it, so I would know how to use it. But if I'm actually going to do any kind of hardware sequencing, then I'm using my MPC key 61 or my MPC one because I think that a Kai when it comes to sequencing and sampling on a hard rare unit they do the best job and they pretty much blow it all the competition when it comes to the sequencer and stuff like that out of the water there are no audio tracks and stuff on here but you do get audio tracks with the uh, mpc1 and uh, i can record in a linear fashion or i can record in a pattern fashion so on and so forth mpc key i think it's kind of it's a, a runaway when it comes to the mpc's akai's product but as far as a live performance instrument i think this is where the roland comes into its own and it kind of takes the cake and kind of beats the akai because of all the real-time controls and and other things just like being able to come in here and uh, navigate your various sounds you know what i mean where you can uh you know look for sounds and stuff hit enter and do a search stuff like that akai doesn't have a search where you can search for different stuff and so you know you got a bunch of you know, thousands of sounds in there and sometimes you get a little lost or you can't find that one sound that you found before and you don't remember where it was and you just can't find it again you remember what's called soft something sense something lead something but now you can't find it again and um but with this you don't have that issue because of the way everything is laid out so roland has really done an excellent job and so i really do like this keyboard But I use it as a top tier key keyboard and I don't use it as my main keyboard. So I have a bottom keyboard and that's my main keyboard. And then I'll use it as a top tier keyboard for you know different sounds like horns, uh, maybe some strings, uh, maybe some synth stuff, synth leads and solos and stuff like that. And uh, that's what I'm using this keyboard for when I'm playing live or maybe I'm gonna split a keyboard. I'm gonna, you know, a bass in the left hand and a right hand doing something. Sometimes it's easier just to have a bass, a dedicated bass on a keyboard and that's just, it's just bass and I don't have to worry about split points and stuff like that and so i will use this keyboard for that now you may ask the question why don't you use it as your main as your main keyboard right why don't you use it as your main keyboard and there's one main reason for that now uh i will use it as my main keyboard if i'm if i'm using it in conjunction with uh main stage and i'm using vsts and stuff like that then no problem using this as my you know my main keyboard my only keyboard or whatever if i'm you know using you know vsts and stuff like that however if i'm not doing that then the, here's the reason why i don't typically use this as my main keyboard when i go play on a gig or something and it's because i need my main keyboard to be able to do a lot of heavy lifting and this can do a lot of heavy lifting but it falls apart in one area i feel like for my playing style it falls apart now your your mileage may vary your playing style could be different but that is in the area of the polyphony architecture i find the polyphony architecture in the roland is not as good as it is in other units that i own and i'll just give you an example here i'm going to go to here let me just select this scene 
So this scene is uh, made up of three different instruments. It's a, a acoustic piano, it's the RD-1000, and a pad. And that's what makes this up. And I did a whole video, a whole two videos really, where I talked about the polyphony in the Roland Phantom. And it's really no different in the Phantom O, except for one thing, that this doesn't have the V piano sound engine. So I don't have the option of choosing an unlimited polyphony um, acoustic piano in this keyboard. So here we are here. I'm just gonna play a song. So as you could hear, the piano was really cutting out really bad um, in that um, while I was playing that song, the, the piano is just, it can't keep up. It just really cuts out uh, the sound. I'm not able to... It just it cuts out the piano is always cutting out it's like the polyphony cannot keep up now that's a supernatural acoustic piano uh, but the same thing happens on the zen core piano uh, if i use a zen core piano same thing kind of happens um if i'm layering sounds like that together so i gotta make a compromise i gotta get rid of the pad or get rid of the rd 1000 sound And I actually found out this issue when I was actually on a gig and I was playing and I had this all set up and uh, something was going on and I went to do that and you could hear that how it cut out. And if you know anything about gospel, we do that kind of thing all the time. So I had to just turn off the has to turn off the other sounds so uh but with my other keyboards i don't really have to do that um and people could say well you're 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 it's, it's because you're pedaling it's because the way you play it's because no it's not because of my specific uh playing style um i mean yes my specific playing style brings that out but this is not as powerful as other keyboards on the market in the polyphony department so here we have some chamber string i just set up a chamber strings here uh some sounds and uh, the way I have it set up is on channels one and two, I have a violin. Uh, I have a violin on channel one, a violin on channel two. Then I have a viola on channel three and a viola on channel four. And then on channel five, I have a cello. And on channel six, I have a contrabass. All of these sounds are from the um, supernatural uh, acoustic sound set. And so they're solo instruments. And I went inside the system and I made sure they were all set to poly so that they're not set to mono because by default they're set to mono. But I went in the system and made sure they were actually set to poly. So instead of mono. So. So basically I got six sounds here layered. Now I'm just going to. Uh, do a test here and we're going to see when we get notes dropping out. All right. So I'm going to hit a hit a note. I'm going to hit a G and I'm going to hold that down and I'm going to start hitting some other notes. And I'm going to count the notes to see when I can hear notes actually start dropping out. Now, remember, this is six solo instruments. They're supernatural solo instruments. And I'm putting them together like, you know, you put together strings. And I understand it's not completely realistic because, you know, a violin doesn't have a low G like that. But I'm just layering the sounds. So we have six sounds layered together. Here we go. One, two. It already cut out. So that's literally three notes being hit. Cuts out. Cuts out more. So. Thank you. 
mm-hmm. cuts out. So I'm only getting three notes um, before, not even three notes sometimes, before you start hearing cutouts. So if I wanted to put together some sort of chamber strings and stuff like that, um, yes, there's ways you could do it. You could do, you know, use your different splits and split stuff up in different ways so that, you know, the violin wasn't overlapping and certain, but you're going to have some areas where the cello overlaps with the violin and the violin overlaps with the viola and, and some different things. And, uh, this is something that you really have to be concerned about. because things are going to cut out. And so you, the way you have to operate, you know, you, a lot of different like workarounds and stuff. And um, I went into the voice reserve section of it and made sure that none of the voice reserve uh, parameters were set to limits because I didn't want it limiting any of the voices, like reserving any of the voices. Like, hey, just give me all the power you have. Give me as many voices as you can. And I've got six uh, instruments layered here. And that is the uh, that is the result. Now, I can hear people saying, well, you know, those instruments aren't made to be played that way. Just choose, you know, regular strings and don't do it that way. But in my opinion, for, you know, what this keyboard costs about two thousand dollars, I shouldn't have to really do that. But um, that being said, what we can do is I actually have this MIDI to the Yamaha montage. So I can hit shift and hit these buttons here. And now everything turns green. And let me just make sure my montage is ready to go. So now what you're listening to is you're no longer listening to the uh, the Phantom. You were actually hearing, you're actually hearing my montage, which is off, you know, off of the camera. So you can't see it, but I'm playing my montage and I set up my montage the same exact way. I have uh, two violins, two violas, a cello and a contrabass they're all the solo instruments uh i didn't have to go into any parameters and stuff like that and say give me all the polyphony you can give me and stuff like that um but they're all they're all it's set up the same exact way using the same exact similar kind of instruments solo violin solo viola solo cello solo contrabass and i've got six different instruments and they're all represented here with zones one through six just like i had six instruments on the Roland Phantom. And I come here, hit the low G and go. So that's six different instruments all layered on top of one another. And I was able to get all the way down the keyboard holding the sustain pedal and no instruments cut out no notes dropped out but with the Roland Phantom the Phantom O the notes did drop out now we can give all kinds of reasons as to why that's happening when you comes to the Roland Phantom but the, here's the bottom line it's not happening on the competition so I think that Roland really needs to step it up in the polyphony department and, and it's not a matter of throwing more polyphony at it because technically speaking, this can go, the Zen Core sound engine can go up to 256 voice polyphony. The AWM2 sound engine in the uh, Yamaha Montage is uh, 128 voice polyphony. Now that's 128 uh, stereo voice polyphony. And the role when it says up to 256 voice polyphony is not referring to stereo. So really... I think that's some marketing there so that the numbers look better, but it's actually, if you're talking about stereo, it's 128 voices stereo. So it's basically the same, but the way the architecture is done and the way the polyphony is handled by the samples in the montage is undeniably better because I can do this. And if I select the same kind of instruments, solo strings in the Roland Phantom, I know I've done it already. I'm probably just beating a dead horse here. You just, you can't do it. So that's why this is not a keyboard that I use as my main instrument. When I go out gigging, I got a top keyboard and I got a bottom keyboard. 
the polyphony is the thing that really is the bottleneck for this instrument. And you'll you'll run into it if you got drums and stuff running at the same time. You may run into it if you got pads and some strings and maybe some basses and a, a multiplicity of things going on at the same time. And you're actually playing, you know, some chords and stuff like that. You start running into some polyphony issues as an auxiliary board, something where I pick one or two sounds together and I'm playing, you know, hitting some horns or something, bop, 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 or, you know, doing some sort of a wicked, you know, some sort of a wicked uh, lead solo or something uh, of some, you know, like if I'm coming over here. So if I'm doing something like that, then this keyboard really thrives. It's got all the parameters and stuff, all the real-time control, and I can do a whole lot of... I can do a whole lot of stuff, but if I'm going to be actually putting together some production stuff and playing some thick layers and stuff like that, this is not the keyboard for that. So you make a decision. Uh, I, well, I should say I'm. I hope I help. I'm. I hope I'm helping somebody make a decision as far as what they want to do. Maybe you've got other gear. You use other racks, and you're going to hook this up to your other gear and stuff like that and play. So the polyphony is not an issue. Go ahead and do your thing. That's how it is for me. I've got main stage. I've got more sounds than I can count i don't know but you know maybe fifty thousand different sounds or something like that in my laptop computer alone um and then of course i've got a bunch of sounds on my desktop up here as well and so the polyphony is not really an issue when i'm playing live but that's be not because of the board itself but because i'm using other stuff uh with it uh the sounds and stuff when it comes to the filters i think roland did a great job on the filters as far as getting up and running with the user interface the user interface and stuff is good if you like those classic roland sounds you know go with roland um it uh it really it really does shine in those departments a great workflow and i really do like this keyboard but i just wish that the polyphony was better because if i only had one keyboard um it couldn't be this one and i know for a lot of people who are spending you know about two thousand dollars on a keyboard and they're going to buy a you know a high-end workstation which is what this is this is professional equipment um, this is not really, I don't consider this like the prosumer category. This is a professional, a professional instrument for professionals who really, you know, are going to play some music and stuff like that. There are a lot of people who don't run into any polyphony issues when it comes to the Roland Phantom because of their playing style, the instruments and stuff that they choose and whatnot. So, but I do want to just uh, be honest and show you, Hey, there's some limitations when it comes to polyphony here and it may affect you, but if it doesn't, and uh, you do like what you're hearing, you do like the uh, Roland Phantom, I would definitely try it out in the store. But I think the Roland Phantom O for a lot of people can be a great value and a great buy. I'm going to thank you for sticking with me this long. Uh, thank you for watching this video. And uh, I will see you guys on the next video.